Bienvenue, bienvenue. Bienvenue tout le monde. Alors ce soir, on va parler un petit peu en français, et après un petit peu en italien, et après un petit peu en anglais aussi. Parce que c'est international, c'est comme ça, c'est international. Euh, donc je m'excuse d'avance, parce qu'à un certain moment, je vais switcher en anglais, et j'espère de ne pas vous faire peur. When it's going to switch like this, then I change also character. See, when I start speaking in English, it become like completely different than what I am usually. Um, mais j'aime bien quand même rester un peu sur le français parce que en français on dit une chose que c'est vraiment, vraiment, vraiment exactement le centre de la question de ce soir. En français on dit bienvenue tout le monde, right? You say welcome. All... See, there is not a translation in English. It's good that we resist, huh? On doit résister. Bienvenue tout le monde. It means in English it's something like uh, welcome all the world. What kind of word are you talking about when you say welcome all the world? See, because there are so many things in the world. Huh? What? You have dinner with Jupiter and Mars and the stars and everything? Or just with people? Bienvenue tout le monde. These, uh, on the OC we say also, oh, il y avait tout le monde hier soir. Hein? On dit aussi, ah ben tout le monde le sait, hein? all the world knows it. What kind of word do you have in your head when you say something like that? Planet, stars, people, me, you, her, right? Quantum mechanics? Strange, right? Now, the thing that it's, it, it's really interesting for me here is that it was, if Instead, you think that the word is everything that there is. Imagine you think that the word is all the objects that exist. Well, then I suggest you should add also all the objects that do not exist. Right? They have the right to be in the world as much as things that exist, like this chair. And then you also have to add to the word things that could exist, I think. Thinking about the world, it gives me headaches, right? Ça fait mal à la tête, hein? You both say. And then when you start to do this, like thinking, okay, the world is everything that there is, or everything that is the case, suddenly the, the, the mistake that usually I do is like, I start to think about the world like a box, in which I can put things, right? But every time I'm facing one box, And there is always another one. Because where is this box? Where are the borders of the world? It must be somewhere else, right? And then there is another box, and then there is another box, and then there is another box, and then another box. I feel like a puppet coming out from all these boxes, right? It's weird. Give me headaches. Huh? Hitting with my head all this box. It's nice, right? It was not written. That's why I invited a word traveler, some, someone that can travel in different words. This is Claire Pollard, a fantastic British poet, and writer, translator, teacher. What else? As she wrote a play, right? And then also she uh, writes for, for Brodax and Faber. And what is amazing about her is that she can travel words and time. The last book I read, you know of, of, Ovidio, I prefer to say this in Italian, Ovidio. Huh? So she went into the head of a man that is writing about a woman. It's a tragedy, it's a tragedy, but it's a beautiful, it's a be those beautiful tragedies of Ovidio, they become even more beautiful, see? She can do that. Now, the thing is that if, if we start to think about different words, to me, it pops up in my head the ancient Greeks. Ancient Greek or Greeks? Whatever. <laughs> sometimes, I'm sorry, sometimes I ask rhetoric questions they don't need an answer. <laughs> But it makes me think of ancient Greeks. See, in ancient Greek you have different gods. One god for hunting, one god for love, One God for the sun, whatever, everything can be. One God for sculptures, 
One God for desire, one God for war. But none of those gods encompass the other. Not even Zeus. Zeus is the biggest of the gods, but it doesn't encompass the other. Actually, it's a contradiction. It's a contradiction of other gods. Mars, maybe Vulcano, maybe the contradiction of Aphrodite. I don't know, just wondering. What kind of world is this that can contain, what kind of box is this that can, can contain things that contradict each other? It's not a box, it's a monster. But I invited here a poet, a poet that I really like, an Italian poet, Yolanda Insana, and she can do something something very rare that I very much appreciate. She can put those contradictions together easily as a kid play with toys. For example, imagine now in this room there is Jupiter, not the god but the planet. I mean, exactly here where we are. Or we, or Jupiter. Imagine if there is a black hole right here where we are. I'm not talking about quantum mechanics, black hole, so small, we don't care. A big, big, huge one. Here in this room, or the black hole, or us. What kind of world is that? One world for two so different things? But Yolanda can put them together. Then you will read the poem like a puppeteer. You will see how she plays with life and death. They make them living, existing together at the same time. No narratives, no life before death or death after life, all together. And Yolanda, I'm very happy to invite her because uh, the Italian language is dying. She said it's already death. And we need a voice that, that, that can manipulate this language, that can use this language, that can say this language with her voice. It's really important. She said yesterday, she said, she, she looked straight in my eyes and she said, I don't speak English, I don't speak French. I said, you speak Italian? She said, no, I speak only Sicilian. <laughs> Take it or not. And that's why I invited her. In the case, there is a black hole appearing just right now here where we are. She's going to take care of it. Um, and then, <clears throat> what if instead we can just do this with all this problem and say, you know what, the world does not exist. What a solution, right? We all go home happy, the world does not exist. It's fine, we don't need to stay here sitting down in the cold and the wet. But in fact, if we say that the world does not exist, everything, objects, idea, things that does not exist, things that exist, they gain complexity. See? I don't know, it's a little bit like, think of Einstein, how obsessed he was to find just one only law. I was like so obsessed, like why quantum theory, I cannot put it with like relativity? Just one word and one only law. What even if instead there are no one word and no one only law? Then we have to discover all the different laws. It's complexity. Yes, and that's why I would like to, that's why I invited Marcus Gabriel, because he knows exactly how to explain to us why the world does not exist. In which way it does not. Because come on, it's something that we experience every day in the world. How come it does not exist? In which terms it does not exist? But before to let those beautiful people talk in, Yes, I wanted to say just a couple of things. First of all, Homero, he didn't need a universe, just a little sea, the Mediterranean Sea. See how small it is, like a pond, like a paddle? Huh? And look what he made out of it. Heroes, tragedies, stories, secret places, mysterious places, right? And then the other second thing is like, we are thinking that we are producing or making a world with internet, Facebook, look at your Instagram. Hmm? Every file, a name, 
every file in a folder, every folder a name, this little screen we think is a word. Come on, it's not a word. Because if that little thing is the word, then your fat fingers trying to type down on the keyboards, what are them? Huh? Metaphysical fingers? Clear? You want to if you come, I can stop. <laughs> Thank you. Clear um, point. I've always been drawn to thinking about the world because of its impossibility. The world is meant to express, I suppose, the totality of everything on this planet. Um, but it's too much. Too big an entity for comprehension. You can't ever get your head around it or hold it in your head at once. And that's one of the great problems facing us, I think, um, with issues like climate change. It's just too big. Uh, we can't process it. I'm interested in the idea of omniscience, though, even if it's beyond mortals. I think that's one part of religion that even secular people struggle to let go of. One of the things I found comforting about God as a child, I suppose, is this concept that he sees everything. He can comprehend the world, every, every detail, every sea cucumber or ladybird or grain of soil or swear word we mutter under our breath, every fumble, every meal, every thought in our skulls. His mind can somehow contain it and witness it. And that idea is very reassuring, um, that idea of total knowledge um, of the world residing somewhere at least. Omniscience is something I keep coming back to as a subject in my poetry. Um, and I'm going to read a poem now about the mythic figure of Cassandra. Um, she is, of course, a prophetess. She can see the future. And I started to think that if she could actually see the future, um, perhaps she wouldn't just be seeing the Trojan War. She'd be seeing the whole unfolding history of the earth until its end. Um, and I tried to fit it all into this poem, which is also impossible. Cassandra in Mycenae. So Agamemnon tugs a spluttering flap in his daughter's throat, and home is a trap. In malignant Greek sun, the scops owl hoots, and a wife will axe at her husband's guts, slop a slick maze in dust, children plot, things fall, squalls of blood flood the land. And you don't believe me, of course. The alternative's worse, so go on, cover your ears. You know what? I'm glad you don't hear. It's gobbledygook. I'm a freak. I lie when I say this is only the start, that emperors will make death sport. People cast the first stone. Men invent thumbscrews, the rack. A chair you can dunk women in. Honour killings and pogroms, original sin. You find this depressing? Dismiss me. But the future will happen the same. An Iroquois babe boiled to bubbling smallpox, a whip player back to a sugarcane field, a sign writer scribe, our bait mac fry, faces melt in Japan. Child soldiers carry Kalashnikovs, Coke cans. Oh, every night Eric and Dylan enter the school cafeteria, towers fall, hysteria, yo la vi, yo esto tambien, the long march crawls through my night sweats, my mares and the Berlin Wall, the gulags where men chew a maggot-laced horse, lynchings, napalm, the S-21, zodiac, dharma, the west, the atomic bomb, icebergs slouch into the sea. The snake licked my ears and they spat in my mouth when they gave me this curse. And the earth is cursed, so you're right to naysay. Go on, raise an eyebrow, shrug it away. Buy raspberries in March, the villa in Pompeii. In my head, it's rolling news. And after a while, being perfectly useless, your face has to dry. Your heart goes on to stand by. For all stories end with death. Those that don't are the teller looking away, and I don't get that luxury. See, now evenings come. Turtles cover their eggs on the beach, mountaintop beacons burn, the amethyst tapestry spread on the floor, Agamemnon's hands on the door. Don't watch, don't listen. Darkness is sweeter than vision. Bury your face in a rose, pour some wine, feel the in and the out of your breath. Ignore me, please. 
ignore me in death. Um, and now I'm going to read another poem about omniscience. Um, I'm terrified by our growing surveillance society. Um, and I find it hard to comprehend why everyone else isn't, in a way, how easily they accept it. I think it's partly because the internet has taken over from that idea of God being omniscient I was talking about. For centuries, humanity always felt it was being watched um, at every moment. And I think this knowledge gave even our smallest actions a sense of importance. Um, and then when that's withdrawn, there's suddenly the sense that we're trivial and tenuous, disposable in an indifferent world. Um, and now social media has filled the void. It's always looking, watching, tracking, saving. No evil tweet can be deleted. And we'll go, or we'll go unread and unpunished. Goodness will be rewarded with likes. Our whole lives are archived and remembered. It is our recording angel. Um, this summer, I was asked by Edinburgh Festival to write a poem inspired by Philip Larkin, an English poet, uh, to mark 30 years since his death. And he has um, a wonderful poem called Lines on a Young Lady's Photograph Album. Um, so this is my update. Lines on a Young Woman's Instagram feed. Last night, I came upon your feed quite late, was looking for distraction to strip mine some dirty chicken wings, finish the wine, already tasting of its ache. I kill time with your little squares of time. What full, full days, each moment is a pose. The chair that's been distressed, the knowing cat, kimchi or pork ribs from some pop-up pit. The jam jars, tilted, pouty rose, graffiti in the toilet, is this it? And then the pictures of your many friends, their t-shirt, lipstick, cartons of craft beer or cold brew in the park, the rigid cheer of bearded boys whose smiles intend by seas and fairground skies you filter bluer. All pretexts for the focus of your art. You on the bus, made up, your new tattoo, you smolder, wink, and tip your head at you. Your lips hover slightly apart. You wait for me to press a heart, I do. I heart your stuck-out tongue, sucked cheeks. I like your pastel nails, fun earrings, funny face. No moment of you is allowed to waste, but cropped until it's almost like you're perfect and live in a perfect place. A bubble tea, pale light in a green tree, an aeroplane, a stage from far away. I envy you each saturated day. I lose so very much of me. Myself is something squandered, poured away. A single set of memories soon breaks or burns. I scrab around for ones I've lost, whilst yours are here, immortal, prettiest. And every phone your I and every shot your iPhone takes, you know that you are watched by something vast. Attention's being paid, though you're alone. The prawn pasta for one you carefully make in your small flat redeems itself. My take away begrimes my curtain home, whilst yours is petals lit upon a plate. I do not know you, beautiful. Don't fear. I witness you, the loveliness you need, and almost from an angle do achieve the flash that's shining in your tear. I'm pressing play and watching as you breathe. <clears throat> it's not just governments and corporations, though. The internet has made us all more omniscient, or at least offered us a taste of it. If we can't know about the whole world, there's at least a sense it's at our fingertips, our fat fingertips, if we want it, um, that like Faustus, we can learn of every star or plant or gaze on every beauty. Um, there's nothing that isn't a couple of search terms away. And we're constantly bombarded with adverts, noise, signs, forms, information. But what are we to do with it all? The more time we spend on Twitter, the more tragedies we don't respond to, the more we realise the knock-on effects of every single tiny thing we do, our words, our habits, our votes, our purchases. It can seem like we're playing a kind of horrific global game of consequences where goodness almost becomes an impossibility. You can't even switch on a light or make your son a cake without having done harm. 
Um, this is a sonnet, uh, a kind of love poem that talks about consequences. I was thinking of um, John Donne um, and those poems where he makes a map of his lover and talks of the sun and the world. Um, but love can be very selfish, of course. It's often about excluding the rest of the world. Um, like Antony to Cleopatra in Shakespeare, let Rome and Tiber melt and the wide arch of the ranged empire fall. Here is my space. The sufferings of a people dissolve to nothing. Uh, this is a sonnet then. It's set in... Um, do you have Sainsbury's over here? It's a supermarket. Dinner for two. The CCTV's globed eye stares me down as in the supermarket's blinding maze. I pick spice from the Indies, Asian prawns and blueberries as dark as Incan skies, New Zealand lamb and Guatemalan peas. A girl tuts, no, the air miles at Monge too, and I too feel that bland guilt nag at me, but words of worlds are nothing next to you. I take my plunder home, prepare a feast to show I care to counter your day's stress. I pour Sancerre like perfume on your feet, the spoils of sea and sky, the east, the west. The earth contracts, our room is everywhere. In love, one kiss, and any trade seems fair. Um, talking about the world from a slightly different angle in the next poem, I'm very interested in mystery and folktale and the supernatural. Um, my last book of my own poetry, Changeling, was full of folktale and ballads. Um, I like to exercise a kind of, um, the, the English poet Keats had an, an idea called negative capability, where you could kind of hold two opposing ideas in your head at once, and I believe and don't believe in these things. Um, I've always thought that if we actually found a, a unicorn or the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland, um, after a few weeks we'd have completely normalised the idea, actually. It would just be a horse with a horn or a large reptile. Um, it wouldn't be any big deal at all. Um, we, we want to believe in these things so much because we don't believe in them. We want to think the world can still astonish us. Um, this is a poem about a kind of local legend in England where I grew up. There's this belief uh, in the north of England, I, I grew up near Manchester, um, that there are panthers on the loose in the moors. Um, and I used to watch for them with a lot of longing as a child. The panther. Frayed now, tongue worn, the legend tells that my parents, young and expecting me, walked beneath blood sprays of berries plotting their future when woods convulsed with a pitiless roar thicket shook with the rage of an engine of dragons of demons of hunger made meat they ran all the way back to their bungalow a week later she heard the growl on radio if you hear this sound beware it is a panther about to attack as a girl, I pored over theories. Big cats as escapees from menageries, Victorian travelling circuses, prehistory, death. I found a picture, melanistic leopard, the eye like a chalk pit or toad spawn, teeth the sour colour of lamb's wool in the jaw. And at dusk, I sensed them out there, other, the beasts of Bolton, Bobman, the fen tiger, nuzzling a deer's bowels, careful as burglars. In this city, now, I had forgotten them. In the scuffle of commonplace violence, the friend beaten for a bite, his eye popped out like a tiny moon. The needle tracked crack whores smearing dung on our stairwell, the lean dark men in hoods who may have guns. But tonight, as I swallowed some small rejection, I found myself willing it true. Longing caught in my throat for a panther's leap into view, like the opposite of disappointment. Um, and here's a, a poem about the idea that there might be other worlds running parallel to our own. Um, this, is a, this is a ballad, uh, it's written in the old ballad form, and it's about fairyland, the lure. When you are knackered and cheap food cramps up your guts with pain. You'll hear the fairies through the glass beyond the mizzling rain. They sing you deserve more than this, more than the toil and blame, somewhere that's light and glittering, escape child to elf fame. 
They lured me barefoot from my bed through night to the wild hill. I watched it split like a dark skull to show a wondrous hall with violins and green cupcakes, rubies and perfumed oils and cocktails of nightingales' tears all framed by crystal walls. And the Earl Queen in pure gold robes, whose hand I dipped to kiss, said, if you look, child, but don't eat, you can aspire to this. And so each dusk that fairy land called me across the vale. I danced the night with comely men and leave there drained and pale. At home I became listless, cold, I would abruptly snap. I spat their soup out, called them boars, their kindnesses were traps. They said, there's beauty here as well in hedge and bloom and day. There's us. I laughed out loud at that. My whole life passed this way. I knew I deserved more than them more than the hard and plain, somewhere that's light and glittering. I belonged in Elfame. Then one night thought, what if I ate those cakes that they forbid? What if a mortal means I stay? And all illusion fled. After one crumb, the glamour slipped. Water rats gnawed in swamps. The fairies were the grinning dead. The hall was a death camp. It was a blasted, withered place the wasteland where I'd been. The spell, once broken, broke my heart. It smashed like a glass screen. Um, And that poem is, of course, also in a way a kind of allegory for the world invented by the media. This L fame made me think of fame. The kind of false parallel world we read about every day that doesn't really exist and that distracts us from what's real. But there are other worlds too real ones that coexist and barely acknowledge each other, worlds we build out of our perceptions and experiences. This is a poem about um, East London, where I lived until recently, I now live in South London, um, and how little my world touched some of the young men there. It's called The Schools of Dalston. Dalston is the name of the area of London. There's a lot of gang violence there. Um, The Schools of Dalston. Of late, Overnight, leering graffiti skulls appear on London's walls. Sherbet death heads, jack-o'-lanterns, acme eyeballs pinging in eye caves, tombstone teeth in bubble gums. Mornings also bring mist. A young bloke pisses on a car pissed, nappies bloat in a yard. Corn road, in tip-to-toe pink, a girl shins up the building's wall as though it is a tree. And I'm trying to think this edgy, white, pushed here by price, when I pass a boy just us on the street. He drifts through pale air, white air, focus, jeans low, whole crotch on show, face blacked by his hood's shadow. Our eyes don't meet, why would they? We are not on the same street. If I'm a blank, then he's a void. If I'm the scum, then he's the dregs. If I'm a ghost, then he's a shadow. If I'm pigeon shit, then he's a crow. And he's watching for the love of money crew, the DNA boys, the murder den pussies. And I'm looking at the Ark Hall of Theatre, up and coming shows, acting out a play in my head. Rape, the spurt of blood stairwells. I'm rehearsing a play called Hell. And I know I don't belong on this street. And the street belongs to this boy, but on the next they might kill him because it is the blue borough. He cannot tread where the signs and bins are blue. He cannot cross the turf of the tap dem crew. He cannot cross the turf of the E9 bang bang. He is wearing his slash proof vest. He is wearing his shank just in case. He is looking out for disrespect in a city mapped over mine, my phantom city, my city of the blind, misted cataract neck curtain. If I caught his eye in the dark, would he slash my neck? Did the last flowers he bought stay wrapped by the road? Were they on that front page, fallen soldier? Did his friends spurt blood into gutters as the girls cried kill him kill him in this forest of walls and skulls if i'm the skull then he's the eye caves if i'm the teeth then he's the bowels if i'm the paper he's the tabloid ink if i'm what he thinks then he's what i think so it's best not to look and he does not see me we do not look at each other it is as though we are nothing to do with each other we are sure we are nothing to do with each other and I'm going to finish with this um, poem, which is perhaps a bit lighter. Not, it's not much lighter, slightly lighter. Um, it's about a museum uh, full of taxidermy in London that I take my son to 
Um, and this is, I guess, partly a climate change poem, which is something I mentioned at the beginning. I, I was reading last week that there's probably going to be no coral reef by, left by 2050, which horrifies me, especially as my son's favourite game is coral reef. Um, and the, the idea that we might be the first generation actually diminishing this, what we call the world, making it smaller and less marvellous. Uh, and this comes from our desire to know the world, I guess, to control it, capture it, tame it, make it safe, comprehend it. Um, but this is a poem about my son and the next generation who are going to have to deal with this world, I suppose, in a way we failed to do. It's called In the Horniman Museum. In South London, on a Sunday, we have seen the scratching chickens and alpacas being spitty when the rain drives us indoors, where the taxidermy is waiting, and you race around glass coffins, the hummingbirds in freezes, vulpus vulpus and the service pose like toys in toy shop windows, and the walrus like a punchline. They are animals, as you are, relation of pantroglodytes, each captured by a caption in a tea trader's collection. He paid to have the world paused, all those thousand conscious seeings for one vision, all that I am turned to glaze for one man's gaze. I've not told you about death yet. Can you tell these birds are different? Do you think this heron cruel that he doesn't care about you? It's true, the heron doesn't. Caring something rare and fleeting, if the dead see anything, then it's as hard and black as glass. But your eyes are getting rounder, shouting dare at crocs and gibbons and the peacock's staring blueness. And we're falling through our days in this pissing useless arc, whilst the clouds gather like stuffing, whilst the water's ticking upwards. My child, you are an eye, through your two eyes not yet dark. Can you see your wet-cheeked mother and the whole creaturely kingdom as they stand today before you in their opulence and armour who have held their breath this moment and are waiting for your judgement? Thank you very much. Je me rappelle, me, me ricordo, no? È... Un verso, un, verso, un verso di Shakespeare, e, eh, Amleto, chi di? Je will speak, Doug. Je m'excuse uh, with my English, horrible, horrible. <laughs> Ma Shakespeare, la langue di poetry e simplement langue langue la, la pensée de la langue fait la poésie je parle toutes les langues sans parler, sans parler aucun, aucune langue je... oh. <rire> il y a longtemps tu m'avais dit que tu ne parlais pas français ça c'est quoi ça non je ne parle pas je parle simplement l'italien je suis la génération des Italiennes qui connaissent, connaissaient la langue de, de sa petite patrie, dans la patrie petite. Mais je songe, euh, je sogne une langue de toutes les langues. C'est la mia speranza in un monde sans monde, dove ci sia un monde qui, qui contenga tous les mondes du pensiero, de l'affect. Parce que le monde... Oui, c'est ok, ok, ok. Je pensais que tu voulais continuer en français. Va bien. Je voudrais lire, je lire. Moi, je suis poète parce que je mouvre à un moment les fils des poupées. Quoi les poupées quel what poupette, kind of puppets? Quel poupette? La vie et la mort. What kind of puppets? Life and death. La... La guerre. Heris uh, for the Greek. Uh, Neikos for Empedocle. Et la chose 
de Kling, qui euh, ensemble les, 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 gli elementi, les atomi, et Neikos, odio en italien, Polymos en grec, et Iris contrasto, Charra, arabo siciliano sépare. Il conflitto, le, le guerre non finiscono mai. Alors, Words never end. je vais euh, lire euh, la, la lumière. Pupara sono e faccio teatrino con due soli pupi, lei e lei. Lei si chiama vita e lei si chiama morte. La prima lei, per così dire, ha i coglioni, la seconda è una fessicella. E quando avviene che con penetrazione succede, la vita muore addirittura di piacere. E l'altro testo che vorrei leggere, e allora il poeta che ci fa in questo mondo che non poet. esiste e poi è morto. What a poet is doing il poeta è postumo. That doesn't exist. The poet is dead. No, dead, soltanto pugnalato. La verità, la true, no? della vita, of the life, può fare solo questo, coltellate di bellezza. Stabs of beauty. E adesso tu c'hai il testo? Io c'ho il testo. On a le texte ici, on ne s'est ah. pas projeté, donc je vais le lire après. Tutti, in, 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 tutti, in tutto il mondo, scrivono. Hm? Sono poeti. In all the world, people write, they're poets. The poet, eh, poet di verità. Poet of truth. Poet di parole. Poet of words. Un malato è una libertà. La so poesia freedom. è libertà. Poetry is e allora freedom. ognuno si gratta la sua poesia come una malattia, maladì, la rogna. So no. each one scrubs his own scrub poetry as Tutto. rages or something. Alla poesia non c'è rimedio. Rabbia. Chi ce l'ha se la gratta come rogna. Forse mm. è meglio. Who has poetry? <laughs> who, has the, who has poetry? Who is a poet? Is just scrub it off. Eppure. Like parasites. <laughs> Eppure il poeta sfortunato o si impicca o è martoriato. Yeah, or maybe the unlikely poet hanged himself or is a martyr. E di te diranno. And about you they will say. È morto e va cantando. He's dead and he's still singing. Marocco e non mi scastro, dove il pane è più salato, e lascio la melassa alle formicole. I barricade myself and won't get out, where the bread is saltier, and I leave the molasses to the ends. Quando è il caso, when the time is right, mi calo la visiera, I put down my visor, e do coltellate di bellezza, and take stabs of beauty. Questo era il primo gruppo di Zer. Adesso avevo... Dove la poesia? That was the, just the first group. Eh, ci perdo. Ma è come the same. Eh? eh? A luce, lumiere, lumiere. Ecco, ecco, ecco. Chi è che diceva la luce, no? E la preghiera di eh, Agamennone a Zeus. Zeus in Sofocle, eh? uccidimi. Zeus, kill me. Ma nella luce. But in the light. Eh, Agamennone è impazzito. Agamennone go crazy. Sta falciando, <coughs> uccidendo un greco pensando che fosse lui. Shepherds. La luce è della mente. La luce della verità. Killing shepherds thinking they were enemies. La luce 
contro la follia Light che madness. attraversa il nostro mondo. Light against madness that go through our world. Allora, donne-moi la lumière. La lumière. Pupare, questo no. Allora. Ecco. Eccoci. Abbiamo trovato che questo secondo punto che io volevo toccare, il pesce cane, to si intitola il pesce cane the shark. morto. The dead shark. Allora, il pesce cane, the shark. tutti lo conoscono, l'hanno visto, i bambini sono attratti perché oh, questa cosa enorme, ci sono i film dell'orrore. A shark is attractive, even kids they want to see a shark. Però pesce cane e anche tutte le parole raccontano storie. Ah, oh, but also shark, like every other word, it tells a story. E c'ha un significato la parola, che è quella sul dizionario. And the word has a meaning, that one that Best you can find in the dictionary. Pesce cane. It's a e poi beast. Un altro animal. significato. And then another meaning. Però io dicevo metaforico. Eh? Metaforico meaning. Come... Con questo significato pesce cane è una parola che nasce con la prima guerra mondiale. Shark, pesce cane, is like dogfish. Is a word that tutti quelli che si Is a word that 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 appear with the first no with the second world war, la seconda guerra mondiale. La prima, la prima, with the first world war. Perché i pesci cani, quelli che mangiano the dogfish, la vita e il bene il pane degli altri ci sono sempre stati nel mondo questa parola è perfetta perché il pesce cane ha una costituzione particolare mandibola e mascella ok this is more difficult I, I got lost can I have just one second so the shark the shark in Italian is pesce cane which is like dogfish it's a mix between a dog and a fish and this word has been invented in the first world war But actually, because it was like people that were eating people of other people, or eating other people. But actually, yes, we invented this word now. But sharks, they always exist. Resta sempre aperta. The mouth of the Anche shark è morto, è is still open and closed even when it's Inviotti. dead. It eats even, even when it's dead. Swim and eat. Even when it's dead, a shark opens his mouth and eats Uh, fishes that are alive, even when it's dead. Servi e padroni è la storia del mondo, vecchia come il mondo. It's the story of the world, old like the world. But we don't want it anymore, this story. It's enough of this story. Lumière, please. Il pesce cane morto continua a inghiottire pesci vivi. Sbatte la finestra. Cambia scenario e battuta, e però dopo tanta incazzatura, ho voglia di sbraitar cantando, perché l'ultima parola non è detta. Voce di silenzio, è la voce del padre e del figlio, mentre il padrone grida a me tutti i microfoni. Stecchiti dal gelo, caddero d'inverno gli uccelli. Crolla il balcone con tutti i gelsomini e le ghirlande di cipolle, ma io non sono parente stretta della morte e non voglio baciare chi se ne va. E per chiudere questo secondo blocco, un altro passaggio da un altro libro che si intitola E questa la ricchezza. To just finish this second uh, part, I would like to read another poem. Quale ricchezza? About Dobbiamo tornare alla terra. We have to go back to the earth. Cosa stiamo facendo? What Noi diciamo, eh, eh, vabbè, non c'è problema, il clima, eh, e ci ammazziamo, no? Ok, there is no problem, we kill each other, eh, there is this corpo, global La terra warming. brucia, no? The planet is burning. Mm. C'è problema. There is no problem. Andiamo su Marte. Go to Mars. Ma Marte 
adesso non possiamo vivere, ma fra 100, 200 anni, on Mars we cannot live, but in 100 years we cannot live there. Lo bombardiamo con i gas serra. We bomb it with serra gases. Si sciolgono, si sciolgono i ghiacci. Dopo facciamo una cosa, buttiamo i semi. And then we, we bomb with seeds. Eh, eh, facciamo crescere, quindi ci sarà la, la nitrite carbonica, eh, ci sarà l'ossigeno. Dopodiché, fra 100, 200 anni, noi possiamo andare a vivere tutti senza un, un viaggio eh, di sola andata. E poi, in un modo, senza tornare indietro, possiamo andare a Mars in 200 anni. Intanto distruggiamo fuochi. Incendi. Ma for the moment let's non burn the planet. Non è fatto di prima. Ci siamo scordati che il cordone ombelicale noi ce l'abbiamo con la Terra. We forgot that the ombelical cord we have it with the planet. Alle emozioni, alle prime emozioni. And we have to get back to the first emotions. A vivere e scambiare l'empatia tra gli umani. Empathy and emotion between humans. E non la lotta humans. tra gli umani. And not the fight and the, and the war between humans. Dopo Chernobyl Ecco, questa è la ricchezza. Dopo Chernobyl nascono fragole giganti, alberi, alberi, pardon, alberi metapina, boh, pardon. Again, again, we start again. Alberi metapino e metà abete, agnelli a cinque zampe, bambinelli con un occhio e senza piedi, deliranti. Vigilare, disinquinare, restituire il letto ai torrenti, l'acqua agli abbeveratoi, l'erba ai conigli. A questo serve la ricchezza, è questa la ricchezza che serve. Svegliati e svuota il letamaio, il concime serve per il mangime. Ma questo è un testo corale, eh? di umani come sono, presi dalla collera, dalla malinconia, gridano di giù. Le opposizioni continue, le contraddizioni che ci sono. Contradictions Però è la keep going situazione on. degli umani the su questa of terra, in questo in planet, mondo, con questa in this economia. World, this economy. Adusti da collera e malinconia, gridano e digiunano, gozzovigliano e tacciano, piangono e sperano, disperano e ridono, ma il fuoco è sparso sulla terra, che arde e brucia, e morte manifesta, non possono rifiutare. Credo che questo chiude questo testo, ed è questo era questo, il secondo blocco e the second part eh, adesso uh, c'è un, un, un terzo blocco the rapido terzo. soprattutto Technical quando si è piccoli no? non serviva ma con la carta il terzo blocco appunto la terra brucia l'ho detto no? ecco esempi di storia qual è la storia recente no? esempio della the storia qual è la storia recente non vedo più questa ah questa no The planet is burning. È perché appunto dicevo prima le guerre not finish mai, never. Never. War never ends. E a Napoli diceva gli esami non finiscono mai. In Naples they were used to say Come si chiama l'attore? Never end. Vabbè. Questo è tratto da un libro che si chiama La stortura. Una parola che in italiano si era scordata, che è un singolare, che è plurale. Non ho detto che è una parola che è quando twisti il ankle o qualcosa. È tornata. Le, tutte le cose storte che si fanno sul piano della giustizia, sul piano del diritto. Tutte le cose che fai in giustizia, 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 quando non rispettiamo le libertà altrui, when, when quando non rispettiamo il nostro modo di vedere, quando non rispettiamo il nostro modo di vedere, è il mondo che non deve esistere.
È un libro di Marcus Il libro di Marcus Gabriel che fa pensare e apre a grandi continui interrogativi. The book of Marcus Gabriel is extraordinary. It's asking, 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 make your brain like opens up. Allora noi siamo bruciati, intossicati, eccetera, eccetera. Jakarta brucia. A Hebron è una carneficina e più di 300 sono i morti sommersi dove con le fogne e gli escrementi si scioglie, scivola, scola il grasso dei potenti. Aria, acqua, terra e fuoco intossicati, affugati, terremotati, bruciati. Però da questa terra che brucia, che è sommersa, ci sono schiere di uomini. È quello che succede nel Mediterraneo da anni. This is what is happening in da the anni io scrivo di queste cose, come se nel parlare nel deserto. I write about those Adesso hanno inventato like in the che ci sono migranti e migranti. Now they invented there are immigrants. Quelli che scappano dalle guerre e allora li accogliamo. Wars, e so poi ci sono them. quelli che sono migranti economici. And then there are those that are, uh, economical immigrants. Si dimentica però di dire che scappano dalla fame, dalla guerra, dalle torture, from, che from non sono riconosciute. E su questo brano che io ho preso, eh, che tra l'altro avevo, poi non sono andata a Lagos, che era un festival, non ci hanno invitato perché ci sono state queste carneficine. They didn't invite her at the end to Lagos era because they were this di questo andare e venire. Problems about this e noi, and going. noi europei, and we European, noi avanzati, ci siamo dimenticati we just quando forgot. la fame, la miseria ha spinto la popolazione dalla Mongolia, la crisi veniva dalla Cina, li chiamavano barbari e sono China. arrivati e hanno attraversato l'Europa, non c'era l'agricoltura e andavano avanti e dopo lo trovavano e mangiavano were, e sono arrivati alle coste dell'Africa and then finally they arrived sono to the coast of Africa passati per tutta l'Europa hanno saccheggiato loro they went through Europe and they, they just li abbiamo chiamati barbari barbers e noi eravamo gli barbers. avanzati right. poi siamo andati in Africa no? And then we went to Africa abbiamo portato la civiltà and then poi we siamo andati in Iraq civilization to Africa and then we abbiamo portato to la libertà Iraq and we bring freedom killing them io sono stata in Iraq I was in Iraq nell'89 in the 89 nel momento in cui in moment, la, la, la guerra è finanziata da chi lo sappiamo, financed by who we know exactly Iran e Iraq, between Iran and Iraq, non hanno mai fatto la pace, comunque non si peace. sono più sparati. But e sono stata, sono stata invitata dal Ministero della Cultura by per un festival e si hanno portato a vedere sullo stretto no? le cose. Ed era guerra di trincea, perché c'erano queste case nel deserto, dove le scritte cambiavano. Davanti c'era una scritta che era irachina e dietro c'era quella okay, scritta. Okay. Quindi la guerra proprio di trincea, conquistare nel deserto. Exactly the war of the first, the same war of the first world war. Parlo dell'89. Border war, in which in one side you have You have a sign written in Iraqi and on the other side you have a sign written in Iraqi. Appunto, bambini, the same kids sono stati ammazzati, that then died, che io ho visto, no? that have been killed. But I saw them, kids with, the president, the with the portrait of the president, the photograph of the president in their hand. The book that I really love is like The Sleeping Eye. In which is written this story of a travel to Iran, and it's the story of Islam. Insana is a word of Quran. La creatura diventa. And the living creature means the living creature. The, la parola, the word, exists in God. The word exists still. Eh, eh, avec le signifié, 
di Gentil Cortese, che nel Corano torna continuamente, nel Corano indica le creature viventi, tutte le creature, dalla pianta. In the Quran it just address, just say that sun is all the creatures that are alive, everything that breathes, everything that has life. E allora leggo questo andare e venire di questi migranti. Vanno, vengono, vengono, vanno, avanzano, indietreggiano, vengono, vanno, vanno, vengono, sommuovono il suolo e sotto i piedi e cupo il rimbombo. Vengono dai tropici e dall'equatore, da deserti, savane e foreste, alture e pianure in cerca di pastura. Vengono da guerre, genocidi e carestie, da terremoti, tirannie e maremoti, e in fuga vanno per terre straniere. Morti di fame, si trascinano dove c'è un pezzo di pane, un morso di companatico, topi che cercano il granaio, formiconi a caccia di pagliuzze, si incarrettano per mare in gusci di noce, scivolano, scivolano in acqua e affogano e niente vi trema. Per voi sono morti che si aggiungono ad altri morti. Cosa resta il poeta? L'urlo. Only the scream is left to the poet. L'urlo. Only the scream. L'urlo di Abu Nubas. È un testo che io ho scritto appunto in quel libro, in quel viaggio. Abu Nubas è un poeta assassinato. Abu Nubas è un poeta che è stato ucciso. Contemporaneo di Carlo Magno. Contemporaneo di Carlo Magno. Siliano, nato in Persia, cresciuto alla corte del califfo al-Rashid a Baghdad. Al-Rashid, personaggio storico. Historical character, al-Rashid. Is a, con, is a presence that continue Nel, to exist in the history. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a character that exists in the, in the uh, one, uh, one thousand one night. Rashid, al Rashid, e il poeta Abu Nuwas stanno sempre insieme. Okay, al Rashid and the poet they're always together. Però il potere, lui il poeta. One is the power and one is the poet. And he knew really well the Greek poetry. Because Baghdad was like a cultural center. Not only a scientific and philosophical center, but also a cultural one. The new poetry. Okay, Abu Nuvas gets killed, gets murdered by the power. Get killed by Al Rashid during a banquet. During banquet. Je suis arrivé à la fin, à la fin. Hein? Ça, c'est la fin Non, non, la fin, je ne la parle pas. Et là, la fin, c'est que j'ai vu. Et je voudrais lire un, un poème, un petit poème, sans traduction. Parce que la force de la poésie, Et dans les mots, comment je dis à, 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 au, au principe, non? à l'initio, et l'essence les, passe à travers les, les, les suons, les fon, la phonée, il suono, suono comme il se dit. Le son, le son, la phonée, c'est bien, la phonée, c'est bien. Euh, son est 
soul, anima, si può dire, la possiamo usare questa parola ancora? Can we use the word soul? Quello che vogliamo metterci in soul, nell'anima. Whatever you want to put in the soul, can you say soul still? Passa e presente nel suo. Eh, the nel, soul is present in the sound. Nella parola e nelle parole. Allora, il y a beaucoup de langues, des citations, les grecs, l'italiano, l'italien, latin, oui. Oi nostri caloi, salamoianti, poietai poematon, par lexicon. Autore pei così mette nei mondi poi, in ic lacrime remo, gilidesque foglie crebento, blanciscono per me. Didomi toi fonen, fonen. Merci. Thank you very much. Marcus Gabriel. <clears throat> well, I'm tempted to develop a theory of poetry now. <laughs> uh, I won't do this, even though I thought I cracked poetry at some point today, but I forgot the thought. So I think for a moment today I knew what the essence of poetry is, I just forgot. However, this is not what I'm going to talk about. So today <clears throat> I will rehearse some of the arguments that lead to <clears throat> a justification of the claim that the world does not exist. So I do believe the right, I will say, I will define all my words and I will uh, run you through a line of thought um, that will and with the justified acceptance of the view that the world does not exist. And I've replaced <clears throat> all worldviews on, on a certain theoretical level by something that I call fields of sense ontology. So I will spell all of, all of this out in detail. I think I have like, what, 30 minutes or something? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. OK, so, <laughs> so let me start with a few definitions. A, a few definitions. So let's say that metaphysics is the theory of absolutely everything which exists. So metaphysics is interested in the furniture of reality. Metaphysics is trying to figure out how everything, in the broadest possible sense of the term, hangs together. That's what metaphysics is. And metaphysics arguably has been invented in the so-called axial age, roughly by the Greek philosophers. And it's uh, one of the biggest intellectual mistakes of all times. It's based on a number of fallacies, it's terrible, and we only started being, even gathering the slightest insights into the fallacies that lie behind metaphysics roughly for the last two centuries, but we, we never really overcame it. So the right thing to do with metaphysics is to show why it doesn't work. Okay, so there, there was a brief period in the history of philosophy where people said we should get over metaphysics. In particular, Derrida has insisted on this point here in Paris. But he, they never gave us any argument. They just said metaphysics sucks. But the question is, what's wrong with it? You know, I, I agree that metaphysics sucks, but it sucks because it's based on fallacies. And that's what's interesting about it. So you can't get rid of metaphysics by saying you shouldn't do it. Okay. And uh, uh, unfortunately, philosophers at some point said we shouldn't do metaphysics. And what happened is that physicists took over. And they're even worse at it than philosophers. So metaphysics as such is already bad. It's in pretty bad shape. But then physicists took over, and they're bad at metaphysics. Metaphysics sucks and physicists suck at metaphysics. So that's really bad news. And this is where we stand right now. And you hear people like uh, popular physicists and generally the general audience somehow thinks that uh, science is omniscient. That somehow there is a sense in which we could know everything that is in principle and knowing everything, that, the right way of knowing everything that is in principle is, is something that in English you call science. Fortunately, in German, we don't have an exact word for it because we have, you know, like in, like in English, you can say political science, but then science doesn't mean science in political science. 
but, uh, so the German word for science is much more liberal than, for instance, the English word science. But uh, anyhow, what we call science right now is just the idea of omniscience. That's what science is now. And I will argue against all of this. So that's metaphysics, and we will see why this doesn't even work. It doesn't get off the ground. It's a terrible project. Uh, here's another project, and that's a good project. And that's a project which will lead to the insight that metaphysics is impossible. And the other project I call ontology. What's ontology? Well, ontology is um, the systematic investigation into the meaning of existence. So ontology is interested in the following question. What does it mean for something to exist? So we will, I will first sketch some ideas about why metaphysics doesn't work and what metaphysics is and why anyone could possibly be tempted into becoming a metaphysician and then I will talk about ontology. So um, try to draw a list. So here's metaphysics. Try, uh, imagine you want to try, uh, uh, draw a list of everything which exists. Here's a list of things that everybody would think they exist, you know, well, we had some examples, you know, wars and uh, cities and numbers <coughs> and uh, fingernails, uh, maybe the past, definitely Jupiter, up quarks, hands, people, hair, and so on. So imagine you write this list and you're very commonsensical about it. You, you don't try to be very philosophical. You just ask someone on the street, give me a list of things that exist. Give me a few, couple of examples. And now the question is, what do all these things have in common so that we say that they exist? So now we know that unicorns, you know, well, I will say something about unicorns, people question, have questioned that, but there are definitely galaxies and up quarks and hands and people and governments and nightmares and wars and love and hatred. And when I draw up this list, you might wonder, what do all these things have in common? If you now just tell me, well, here's what they have in common, they all exist, then that is not very informative. Okay, you might say they all exist, but now I want to know what is existence? What is it that all these things have in common? And the most natural thing that comes to mind out of a habit of thinking this way uh, of, you know, older than 4,000 years is that you would say something like, <clears throat> they all belong to the world. All these things can be found in a particular place, the world. They are all somewhere in the world. So this is what existence is. To exist is to be in the world. That is the most uh, that's the default assumption of metaphysics. And that is an extremely widespread view. For things to exist is for them to be found in the world. But that already creates problems such as, well, what about the world itself? If for things to exist is for them to belong to the world, then you might want to ask the question, does the world itself exist? If existence is to be in the world, then somehow you would want to say, well, if the world existed, it would have to be in the world. But that can't be the case. The world can certainly not be in the world in the same sense in which there are fingernails or Paris. You can't travel to the world. You're already there. If you try to get there, you're already there. It's not like the world is somewhere in the way in the sense in which Paris is somewhere. So that can't be the sense in which the world exists. If to exist is to be part of the world, then the sense in which the world exists cannot be the sense in which all these other things exist. So the question is, in what sense, if any, does the world exist? And this is where metaphysics kicks in, and it tries to reduce the existence of everything to some kind of feature that everything is supposed to share, so that in the end you can claim that the world exists. Okay? So metaphysics is trying, literally trying, I think, to create the world, to come up with an idea that unifies everything. Okay? And here are just a bunch of examples. You might say, well, here's, uh, uh, here's what unifies everything. Um, Here's a traditional view that no one believes anymore. It's called idealism. A traditional view goes something like this. Uh, um, for things to exist is for them to be thought of or to be perceived. So here's what all these things have in common. Okay, when I draw a list of things that exist, I'm thinking about them. They are on my list. So maybe he, what they have in common so that they all exist is that they're thought of by someone. That's idealism. But you see, this is already absurd because had no one ever thought about them, they wouldn't have existed. So to exist cannot mean to be thought of. That's, an, that's just an absurd view. Even though there are very complicated versions that try to defend the view, Immanuel Kant has tried to cook up a view that is compatible with this, but it just doesn't work. So don't try, don't, don't waste your time on it. I mean, you can make it very subtle, etc., and then it looks smart, but it just doesn't work. Okay, so that's bad. 
And here's an opposite view, equally bad, uh, and I'm simplifying, but it's still kind of correct, materialism. Materialism says, well, here's what it is for things to exist. For things to exist is for them to be material. And now the question is, of course, what is it for things to be material? And then you can be complicated about this because physics is complicated. But someone, we, let's say we kind of understand what it means for things to be material. Let's say you have an intuitive grasp. But then there are so many counterexamples. You know, is the number three uh, material? It can't be studied by physics. Uh, what about governments? Uh, are governments material? Uh, they can't be studied by physics. They're definitely not the object of, of the kind of investigation that figures out how material things work. Okay. You don't go to the physicists in order to f uh, find out whether North Korea is a, is a just society. I mean, we know it's, it's not. But, you know, uh, we don't know this because we've studied physics. Newton doesn't know anything about it. I mean, he didn't know North Korea, but even if he could teleport himself uh, into our time, he couldn't know anything about the question whether uh, North Korea is just or unjust by uh, uh, inspecting um, his equations. So that can be right. Materialism can be right. Uh, and what materialists do at this point usually is they try to reduce the existence of all other things to material things. So they will say something like, well, governments don't really exist. Uh, governments are only in your mind. People think they're governments. And what are minds? Well, minds are brain states. Brain states are material. Haha, ha, we did it. Okay, so that's reductionism. You try to reduce all orders of existing things to the material level in one way or another. But that also doesn't quite work because now you're still saying that governments exist. But you're back to the idealist view where you're saying governments exist insofar as they are thought of. Now, now you have two views. On the one hand, you wanted to be a materialist, but you're suddenly an idealist about governments and numbers and so on. That happens to sophisticated contemporary philosophers like John Searle, a famous philosopher uh, teaching at the University of California at Berkeley, who believes precisely that. He thinks that governments are only in our heads. Uh, uh, heads are not only in our heads, they're brains. And uh, brains are real, and governments are somehow only in our heads, however that exactly works. So all these views, I think, are terrible. These are metaphysical views. You're trying to say what it is that defines things into existence, what numbers and galaxies and up quarks and hands and hair and uh, the Federal Republic of Germany have in common so that we can claim about all of them that they exist. So that's metaphysics. So the question is, how can we avoid all these various traps? And I think the right thing to do is to come up with the right notion of existence. There are, there are different ways of repairing the problem. But I think the right one goes something like this. You need to find out what it means for something to exist. And here's the answer. I will not go into all the details. I will just give you the answer. Uh, for things to exist is for them. I will define this in a second and clarify. For things to exist is for them to appear in what I call a field of sense. Uh, what is a field of sense? Well, a field of sense is a domain where you can find objects such that there is a rule which tells you that these objects go into that domain. For instance, the number three exists means there are the laws of basic arithmetic and they tell you that in the order of the, in the series of natural numbers, the successor to the number two is the number three. That is the sense in which the number three exists. Governments exist. Well, here's the sense in which they exist. Uh, history. Governments are historical entities. They couldn't have been governments without history, okay? And without people believing that they're governments, without power fights and so on. So you will have all sorts of rules that tell you under which conditions you're dealing with the government. And that's what it is for governments to exist. For up quarks, for instance, to exist is for them to fall under a set of laws that we call the laws of nature, even though we have no idea yet how many laws of nature there are and whether they can be unified, etc. That's another question. But for up quarks and bosons and galaxies to exist is for them to appear in the field of sense of the universe, where the universe is the domain under investigation by our best natural scientific practices. But it's not the case that all things which exist are part of the universe notice. Okay? The number two isn't and governments aren't because you can't, they are not in the domain of investigation of the natural science. Okay? So literally speaking, the Federal Republic of Germany is not in the universe. That is, that is not the right way of putting it. Okay? You can't find it in the universe unless you mean by the universe 
the totality of absolutely everything which exists. But now you're back to metaphysics and you owe me an answer to the question what it means for things to exist. So that's, in a post-metaphysical era, the universe cannot mean the world. We got rid of it, okay? The world just doesn't exist. It's completely misguided to think it does. So the picture that I'm drawing now looks something like that. Indefinitely many fields, and for each field there are rules that, you know, once you knew them, you could tell what it is for things to appear in that field. For instance, if you know all the laws of numbers, then you will know for every number, for instance, whether it's, say, a prime or not a prime, and so on. You can know all sorts of things about these things if you know the rules. I call these rules senses. Uh, there's a technical notion there, just think about rules and you're roughly good, rules and laws. But what you never get is a rule or law that governs everything. There is no principle for absolutely everything. Reality, or the realities that we experience, reality is just not a unified entity. We, we are not located in a huge thing that either crushes us or determines what we do, etc. So let me just tell you why this is useful to think this way. For instance, think of the problem of free will and omniscience. So you might think, um, well, um, if all things hang together, so if you're a metaphysician, if all things hang together, then the question is whether the laws under which all things hang together are compatible with our freedom or not. If I now raise my left hand, and if the laws of absolutely everything, the laws of the world, are deterministic and, uh, and determine what happens next, regardless of what we do, then I couldn't be free in raising my left hand. But the field of sense of a philosophy lecture like this one is perfectly compatible with me raising my left hand. Okay? For things to exist in the field of sense of a philosophy lecture is perfectly compatible with people raising their left hand. But of course, if you give a physical description of what's going on here, of all the elementary particles assembled right here, okay, so if you think of me not as a person, but as a bunch of elementary particles that's moving around in weird ways, uh, uh, it wouldn't be me, right? So you wouldn't be seeing me. So uh, uh, imagine, imagine you now wear the, the glasses of physics and you only see elementary particles here swarming around. Okay. Then in that field, no one raises their left hand. But not because no one is free, but everything's determined, but no one's there. So physics doesn't show you that you're not free. You're not there in physics. Physics can't tell you anything about you, neither that you're free, nor that you're unfree. Physics for these questions is as irrelevant as it gets. And the same holds for biology and so on. So you need a very good argument in order to show that, for instance, physics threatens you. I'll give you one more example of this, uh, something that, um, that I just worked out in a, a book that is forthcoming, probably translated into English as something like The Brain and I. The German title is literally I is not brain. Um, so people have thought for a long time, it, actually for roughly a thousand years at least, that uh, there's a problem with God's omniscience. And the problem looks something like this. If God knows everything before even the creation of the world, you see, God's also gone if the world does not exist. Uh, um, here's another problem, by the way. Imagine, imagine the world is everything which exists and God is the creator of all things. Okay? Then good old problem, did God create himself? If God did not create himself, then he's not the creator of all things. But if God created himself, okay, then he's part of the world. Then he's not even different from the world. He's in the world then. So, you can, uh, so uh, uh, there's no way for God to create absolutely everything. No way. So there was the medieval solution and they said, well, he created himself and then he created the world. But that doesn't work, okay? So not only because no one can create themselves, that's bad news, you know, but they said, oh, he can, you know. Uh, uh, don't dare to say that God can't do these things. Okay, so let's say God can create himself. I think that's incoherent. But let's say God can do this. Well, then still he can create everything, okay? So uh, no way. Um, so God's also gone in this picture. But let's go back and imagine that there is a point of view from which you can see absolutely everything, including the future, and that someone is occupying that view, God, say. So that the thought experiment kind of works. Okay, roughly, we are fixing all the mistakes of the Bible. There are more, okay? Um, <clears throat> many more, like don't eat shrimp. Why? Never got that. Okay, uh, um, so 
uh, now everything's God knows everything. And imagine God knows, you know, before the creation or a long time ago. If God knows before the creation that I'm now raising my left hand, okay, then you also knew it a thousand years ago, say. Uh, so God knows a thousand years ago and he's waiting for this moment and I do this. And the question is, does this make me unfree? Of course not. He did not raise my hand. If God raised my left hand, then this would make me unfree. The fact that goes, uh, God knows that I raised my left hand does not make me unfree. This is just a huge non sequitur, okay? Unless God raises my hand, but then God also uh, uh, ran Auschwitz and was killed in Auschwitz and so on. So that can't, that can't be intended. He would be the worst war criminal of all times. Okay? So if you think that God's omniscience pushes you into doing things, then God is also the worst war criminal of all times, uh, um, which might be the case depending on which religion you adhere to. But you know, in, in many of the standard religions, people also think he's kind of good. Um, so that's roughly the story. So where does this lead us? Well, I think it leads us to accepting that there are indefinitely many, what I call fields of sense. So there are indefinitely many ways for things to be. And what we need to learn now, I think, is to understand how they function. Because ideology is precisely the creation of world pictures. This is what ideology is. And this is why world pictures are also politically and socially harmful. Because world pictures create the impression that somehow everything already hangs together and there's some agency responsible for things hanging together. What Lacan, the French psychoanalyst Lacan called the subject supposed to know. So you have the idea that somehow someone knows everything, right? In Germany, until recently, the name for the subject supposed to know was Angela Merkel. She's now threatened. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the idea was somehow, you know, everybody has their own subject supposed to know. So someone who knows, and usually it's God, but then there are also smaller gods, you know, the police, for instance. You know, everybody thinks that, you know, uh, uh, teenagers know this. If they, if they just smoke pot, they're afraid of the police because they think the police will know that they're high. And uh, it takes a while for teenagers to figure out that they, you know, why would they know this? And uh, they're not in your mind. But the police, for instance, you know, why, why for instance, can, su can such a small police force control us? You know, why don't we walk around murdering all the time and looting? Well, because we think they know. Okay, it's like, they're not, while you're on your way to, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, you're this terrorist and you're like, uh, uh, and you think they know. That's why they can know. You know, they know because you're like this sweaty terrorist at the train station because you, th because you think they know. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, and this is how ideology works. And I think that philosophy should serve its function as uh, ideology critique again, which it doesn't do a good job at right now. Uh, obviously, because we have all these ideologies out there. And the right shape of ideology uh, critique is, I think, first get rid of metaphysics and then come up with the right ontology. Okay, uh, here I stop and I think there's somehow room for conversation. Yes. Yeah. Um, now we want to... Yes, exactly. Is the first thing you have in your mind? I'm joking. Hello. Um, thank you all of you for your amazing... Um, I don't know, contribution, very various. Uh, I was just wondering, so if we're talking about a different field of senses, um, for you, what, in which field of sense is uh, art and more specifically poetry? And maybe you could all answer, uh, yeah, each of you. Okay, so this is the what's the essence of poetry question, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I think that, uh, um, well, that's a very classical view, but I think it's kind of uh, correct about poetry. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, like, uh, um, the question is how do we individuate poetry? What kind of use of language counts of po as poetry? But let's say that one of the functions, I think one a big feature of art is that art is indefinable. All art is, that's the point of it. So whenever someone, in particular, if you look at the history of art, and literature too, you know, like by art I now, already there starts the problem, but obviously art includes literature on some understanding. If you look at the history of art, some philosopher will come up with a definition of what art is. And then the next thing the, art, the artist will do is they will produce a work of art that contradicts the definition of the philosopher. And then the philosopher will, co will come up with another, another definition. I think this is one of the big motives of the history of art. Uh, um, uh, so, you know, whatever. Art is beautiful, and then someone does something ugly, but it's obviously art. 
So art is either beautiful or ugly, and then someone does something which is neither, and so on. Art depicts things. You know, Ar Aristotle says, uh, here's the difference between literature and history. History tells you what happened, and art tells you what could have happened. Yeah, but, you know, a poem, does a poem tell you what could have happened? You know, that certainly doesn't work with poetry, and so on. So you will always have, so I'm not going to try a definition. And I don't think that saying that art is not definable is a definition of art. You know, it's, it's not a backdoor definition. It's just not a definition. I'm saying it is an indefinable. But what's, I think, specifically the function of poetry, I think, is um, it shows us that, and, and a lot of literature, it shows us that it's not the um, primary function of language to depict reality. So the, the, the worst view that you can have about language, it's the one most widespread among philosophers, unfortunately. The absolute majority of philosophers today believe that language depicts reality. So speaking uh, for them is something like this. There is a table. The, this is a hand. Uh, Paris is a city. So they think that this is what language does. Uh, but reading any poem, say, will tell you that it doesn't work that way. Uh, and I think that the, the uh, uh, poetry tells you something about uh, what it is to use language in a free way. Uh, it's liberating. I mean, this is, this is uh, freedom came up. You know, it's liberating because it finds modes of expression for something that cannot otherwise be said. That's why you can't replace a poem. You can't, you know, what's the plot of a poem? I can tell you what the plot is of a certain kind of novel. Not for all novels, but I cannot usually tell you what the plot of a poem is. You know, what's the, what's the plot of the poems that we've heard today? You know, a, a, a lot of, there's a lot of violence, of, you know. Like, I can tell you there's a lot of violence, but they said something else. So that's, that's something that I would try. Yes, Claire, I think maybe you would like to say something about this. Um, yeah, I think that's very interesting. <laughs> I mean, poetry, I guess, is... Um, I, I, I very much agree with what you say that it's not about representing a, a single reality. A good poem should al always be open and open to many, many interpretations and that's what makes it poetry in a way, that, that kind of openness. A poem where just X equals Y is usually a very poor, thin poem. Um, so I think that's very interesting. I've lost my other thoughts. L'essenza sono è da sempre, no? La storia, se noi pensiamo, io penso sempre al mondo nostro occidentale, indoeuropeo. Allora, all'inizio i filosofi scrivevano versi. At the beginning, philosophers were writing poetry. Parmenide, il pensiero filosofico di Parmenide è in versi. The, 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 the thinking of Parmenide is on the Loro credevano di fare filosofia. Oui? They believed in philosophy. They thought they did. E facevano poesia. But they were doing poetry. Poi sono arrivati i poeti che volevano fare filosofia <laughs> e non facevano né l'una e né l'altra oggi, oggi com'è la situazione? What is the situation today? Eh, un tempo si diceva povera no? misera et nuda va filosofia o filosofia once, once they were saying like poor and, and, and nude and naked philosophy. oggi noi diciamo Misera e tenuta va poesia. Today we say poor and nude and naked. È una domanda poetry. che se gli umani continueranno a esserci sarà sempre valida e rinnovata. Ma qual è l'essenza della poesia? Io credo sarà sempre un problema, un ask, una question, question, una domanda. Question. For me, è liberté, sicuramente, e emozione. For me, poetry is freedom and emotion. E questo gioco meraviglioso del suono, of the sound. che dice la libertà. 
Sono i suoni liberi come quelli del creato, degli uccelli. Noi siamo delle cellule viventi. La parola è una cellula vivente. E come cellula vivente è poesia. I bambini parlano e fanno le poesie loro. Cercano di avvicinarsi alla parola e, e ci giocano. E questa cosa... Ed è, beh, sì, oggi, cioè, domani, domani potrei dire, dare un'altra risposta, But fare un altro. Tomorrow I can give you another answer to this Thank question. you. Thank you. Um, I, I just wonder, Alex, if you could answer as well to that question. We because... think that there are domains that are separate. And me, I like to squeeze things together. To just, just see if they work, if they can still work. It's like, a, it's like a crazy set of theory, you see? I just like, try to mix things up to see if these different domains, they can share things. Or instead of share things, maybe they can create new stuff. And also because, because sometimes when I read, um, I don't know if I really agree with everything that has been said. I am, but on the other side, sometimes when I read a book of philosophy or when I read like a book of narrow psychology or stuff, There are sometimes there are something, especially when the guy goes banana total, that reminds me of poetry. It's something that is like trying with the words, not to say something that we have the experience of, but trying with the, the word to say something that we don't have the experience yet. And, and, and I see this, this, this human being creating things while he's speaking, probably setting himself free or herself free from from some certain cliches. And I like when they meet because suddenly something explodes. That's why I like when they meet. And in the question, we were talking about what poetry is or art is. But what most people usually think that it is at the very barest minimum is human expression. It's quite interesting at poetry at the moment. There's a lot of um, debate and a lot of new poetry coming out things like Fluff, which is more computer generated and is talking more about just using, you know, calculations, just strip lines from the internet and making poems out of them and so on. And I wonder if a piece of art is created by a computer, and we're getting to that, aren't we? Or a philosophical essay, is it, is it still poetry or philosophy? I think that's a very good question. Uh, I would say no, very clearly no. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, only to the extent to which we build the computers. So if we build a computer and, a com and, uh, and some kind of algorithm that allows us to come up with something which looks like a poem, then, uh, uh, then the entire, I would say that the entire structure is the artwork. So I would not say that the words, you know, like, uh, where, uh, you know, we have torn intuitions about this, right? Some people would say, no, this is an artwork, you know, because uh, if you write a poem, you know this much better than I do, or any author of any text or any utterance, you know, the very fact that the words that I'm now uttering in order to produce a sentence are created in this very moment. I couldn't have thought about them before I was thinking about them. So in one way or another, it's necessary that all meaning is created spontaneously out of nothing. That's absolutely necessary. Try to think about it. So imagine you say the following very simple sentence, I have a hand. Then I did not say the sentence in my mind before I said I have a hand. And even if I had said it in my mind before I said I have a hand, then that was the moment of absolute creation. So all meaning ultimately rests, rests on absolutely nothing. You know, uh, here, as always, the American TV show Seinfeld was right. It's, you know, uh, um, uh, meaningful human life is a show about nothing. But that's the point. And I think that uh, um, in the computer case, you know, we are torn between the intuition on the one hand that art is human expression, uh, at, at the very least, the condition, I agree. And on the other hand, it seems like the computer is doing the art. But I think the artwork in that case is the entire setup, the human being creating a computer, writing something. So it's not the poem that is the artwork, I think, in that case. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be an artwork, I think. <laughs> But just, yeah. No, I just have a question about this computer, this computer story. And uh, from, I had a flash about an orchestra playing some music. 
you know, probably the process is different, but if an orchestra are playing some music, then what is art? Is the music or, or, the, or the invention of the instruments, or then the invention of a technique for this human being yeah. to, to, to play those instruments? <coughs> because in a way, this idea of a computer writing poetry or this uh, orchestra playing music, it makes me think of yesterday night when a certain moment we were talking about consciousness. And like this idea of emerge consciousness, that emerge from a system that we don't really understand. It emerges from patterns of the brain that are activated, but we don't really understand how. Like an orchestra <laughs> playing music, yeah. I'm just saying, like an orchestra playing music with instruments that we don't know what those <coughs> instruments are. I think that there are like, it's, it's, there, are some, there is some kind of feel to discuss this, whether a technique can produce a poem, or whether we can produce a technique that is a work of art that can produce a poem. Because it, it yeah. has to be with perception also, that you, I think, are interested in. But I think Yolanda would like to say one thing first. The computer per se, the computer by itself, it's just the need it. It does whatever you want it. You non want esiste it. un computer assassino. Però se non the mart the computer that is a martyr. Ma c'è i missi, lui diventa un assassino. But if you give rockets to a computer then it becomes a martyr. Se tu gli dai gli le note, usi le parole come note, come strumento, quindi come uno strumento musicale, beh, può fare delle cose, ma è la tecnica lì, poi manca qualcosa che non si sa che cos'è. There is technics and then there is something that is missing. E quello che gli spagnoli dicevano, le sogno, il sogno della vita. You credo. Thank you. Yeah, I think that you know, like uh, what you what you were giving voice to is precisely the ideology of our time. If you look at the ideology of our time, what's going on is um, most subsystems of um, society observing what's going on, not all of them, um, are trying to tell us that no one is free and that everything is somehow mechanical and computer generated and so on. So I think. Uh, we, are, we are very good at trying to deny that we are free right now. I think that's what we are very good at. I don't think we, that we are less free. We have never been free er, we. But, that, uh, but uh, we, are, we are much better at creating the illusion that we are not free. That either our brain is doing the thinking, or that computers are doing the thinking, or that something else is doing things. Why? Because the, the free part of, of the human life world Okay, the industrialized societies are repressing and killing people and are generating uh, uh, the worst kind of moral nightmares that no one would wish even to their worst enemies. That's what we are responsible for. And the best way of avoiding uh, to realize that this is what's going on, so the best way to repress any actual bigger social change or even address the problem, is create the illusion that no one is doing anything. No one is really doing anything. It's our brains, it's evolution, it's computers, it's uh, the, the complexity of human society, it's uh, something inevitable and so on. So instead of destiny and fate and God, we just now think it's about computers and neurons and brains and complexities and so on. But that is precisely ideology. So uh, uh, the, the actual basis that everybody can tell you what the problem is, um, but the, the real problem is replaced by a smokescreen story. For instance, uh, and talking about consciousness, I happen to think that uh, you know, the, the problem is completely ill-formulated. If you think that consciousness is some kind of quasi-spiritual atmospheric thing that arises from stupid matter, then the, the question is ill-posed. Okay? This is not going to happen. And this never happened. So I don't think that, uh, 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 that the right story goes something like this. You see, it's metaphysics again. If you think that the right story looks something like this, and at the beginning there was you know, the Big Bang, then there was a lot of hot shit. And then hot shit organized uh, by some laws, you know, blah, 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 and then people tell you what tipped the scale, and then there are planets. 
And the planets in the beginning are like Mars, you know. Uh, uh, Mars is no fun, no one wants to be there, it's a stupid red desert and so on. You know, think about the movie The Martian, that's what Mars is. But then things got better somehow, you know, and then there was another coincidence, and then there was water, and then cells, and it took a long time, and blah, 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 blah. And, and if you tell this story, then somehow you wonder, but when did consciousness happen in all of this? Okay, and you will not find it. Uh, uh, and uh, the right, uh, which is why, uh, you know, people who believe that this is the right uh, story to tell will sooner or later uh, eliminate consciousness from the picture. They will say, no one is really conscious. Uh, 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 you only have your brain. You are not thinking, your brain is thinking. You are not even there. You think you're there. You're, you're just a software that your body uses okay, in order to achieve your goals. What you really are, I call this in my new book, Neurocentricism, and I argue that Neurocentricism is just the new Eurocentricism. It's new, re, new Eurocentricism. That's what it is. And it's, it's created in a country which I call Europe. Europe is basically Europe plus the United States and Canada and some parts of Mexico uh, and some, some parts of Brazil depending, but that's Europe. And you know, Europe is the Euro, it's the neurons, just think about all these associations. And then, and it's not a coincidence that they're there, you know, neuroscience is big. Well, it's the Euroscience, that's what it really is. So uh, um, I think that's, that we're not looking at the right, at the ideology. So the picture goes, you know, like remember this movie Mars Attacks, again Mars, right? So in, uh, and, uh, uh, in current ideology, people are trying to tell us that we are the beasts from Mars Attacks. Brains, okay, Tr uh, t t uh, body snatchers, right? So if, if, if this view is right, neurocentricism, if what's, what's doing the thinking in you is your brain or your nervous system, then you might as well say something like this. What you really are is a killer ape, okay? And uh, the killer ape is driven by a, by a real machine that's in you. If you're watching Doctor Who, think of the Daleks. So you're really a Dalek and in you is like just a neural network, which is really ugly, okay? Neurons are ugly like hell. So they, they need to dress up, they need to come up with clothes. And, and so they, they look like human beings, like exactly in the Invasion of the Body Snatchers movie. Okay, that's, and I think this is where we are now. It's the Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But it's not because the body snatchers have invaded us. They have never been here. It's ideology. It's a fairy tale. And I think that um, neuro neurology isn't. Neurologin is, is a genuine medical science. You know, it tells you how to get rid of Parkinson. I'm all for it. You know, where do I have to pay? You know, I don't want to have Parkinson. Uh, but neuroscience, in the way in which it's used right now, uh, in the European Brain Project and whatever, is just pure fairy tale ideology. It's exactly what religion used to be like in the Middle Ages, and then we had to have a revolution and the Enlightenment and blah 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 in order to get rid of this. And now it's back, but it, uh, it has a different form. And I think, uh, you know, we need another revolution, but the enemy here is, I think, that particular world picture. Before that, I would like to say that uh, we are just, um, the evening is over, we have to go now, we are closing and then, or, otherwise we lock ourselves, uh, lock us inside. Um, it's just that, uh, it's interesting because yesterday, uh, Paul Brock, which is this, a neuropsychologist, just that, just rise up the question of consciousness, and, and he told another story, he told another story, and then at the end he said, but those are all stories. So those are just stories. I'm telling you one story, but then you're going to tell another story. As much as you're telling a story about yourself, or you're telling a story about the self of the self. So I'm, I am okay with saying to you that actually consciousness is emerging from this stupid idiot's flaming, electronic, sparkling, but at the same time I'm, I can be happy to tell you another story as well. This is just my experience with my, with my, with my job. But Okay, we're telling you another story. And um, Yolanda, maybe you wanted to say something. Yeah, no, mi pare che um, la teoria della storytelling, della storia. I think that the story of storytelling. Sta diventando anche il modo, oltre a renderci schiavi, naturalmente, it's schiavi making us di prima, more slaves than before. Schiavi a una cosa, ma al pensiero dell'altro, in modo totale, e quella è la paura che io ho, 
viene usato anche per creare la letteratura, cioè il romanzo fatto secondo queste teorie. E ancora, ma sta cominciando a nascere, una poesia che si dice quella che il pubblico vuole. Ok, now it's like, it's like the stereo storytelling is producing uh, also a narrative that is like a narrative or a poetry that is addressed exactly to what you expect from narratives or what you expect from poetry. Che risponde ai bisogni del mercato, il mercato. That it respond, that it respond or replies to the, to the needs of market. È perché le, le, le case editrici con la poesia stanno chiudendo dappertutto. Because publishing houses are just closing down, shutting down. E il romanzo è quello e, e ci sono già, già, so ci sono già i sei anche nella novels. letteratura italiana del romanzo, dove il romanzo poi sì, c'è una tradizione, ma vabbè, quello è un altro discorso. But I'm thinking the next time, uh, next time, next time I will invite you again, the three of you, and then the three, the three people that were here yesterday, and I think we will, we will see sparkling, sparkling lights, <laughs> neuron and fireworks. Okay, I'm very happy, thank you. Thank you so much. I think I think we just very good. I'm very happy to be here. And you as well.